millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because, let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high-quality, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork-raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. It's easy to chase after someone's version of life when you don't even know what you want yourself. I have been guilty of this myself many times. What about you? What would it feel like, though, to have your money come alongside the vision you have for your life in a really powerful way? Our guest, Roger Ma, is sharing what you need to learn to work your money, not your life, so you can actually bring your vision to life. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Compton-Game, where we flip the script on the old-school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash cdspecials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC. If there are any silver linings during the last few crazy weeks, months, it's been time to really sit and think. And I want to encourage you to do just that, to sit and think about what you want your life to look like. Where do you want to work? Where do you want to live? What type of relationships do you want to have? How much money do you want to make that will support your lifestyle? What are some of the habits you need to start and some of them that you need to stop? This idea of working your money, not your life, is one of the biggest gifts you can give yourself. That's why I am so excited to have my friend and fellow CFP, Roger Ma, on this episode to talk about his new book, Work Your Money, Not Your Life, and help you find the path to create a vision for your life and figure out the steps you need to take to make that happen. You just came out with a new book, Work Your Money, Not Your Life, and the title is really resonating with me right now. I I love this idea of, of working your money and I really want to know from you. I want you to share us share the story with us. How do you do this? How do you work your money and not your life? 
Yeah, I think for for me or for anyone, the, the the first step is just knowing yourself, knowing what you want, what you like, what you don't like, and and what you want life to look like. I think uh, it's it's really easy to chase someone else's dreams or what you think um, you should do for a career or what financial goals you should achieve when you don't actually know what you want for yourself. And, you know, the, the exercise that uh, I take clients through and I, I do myself could get pretty tactical. It could be um, as specific as, you know, Sean, what time do you want to wake up in the morning? What are you going to eat for your meals? Who are you going to eat them with? Um, what kind of skills are you going to be using throughout the day? And then once you have kind of a visualization of, yeah, what is my rich life? Starting to, to research, what, what does that translate to in terms of what career would help me live that life and what financial goals I have to set um, to, to be able to create that life. And, and so for me, it's, and for, I think all, all the listeners, it's, it's doing that initial exercise and then periodically revisiting oftentimes um, twice, three, four times a year. I'm, I'm asking myself um, is the way that I'm spending my time. And mostly that's in um, my career activities and it is the way I'm spending my money the way that aligns with how I want to live my life. I love that exercise. And when you're talking, it just made me think, I mean, it it sounds so obvious or practical that we would look at our lives that way. And yet most of us don't like where, where's the disconnect? What happens where we don't actually sit down and visualize our life that way and then come up with a career or a money plan that matches that? I just, I think there's so many myths and messages that we're bombarded with on a daily basis and, and, and throughout, throughout our lives. And so um, we might not even think to, to step back and say, well, is that narrative really the way that I want to live my life? Um, and that's certainly what I did uh, for a long time. I didn't question um, what path I was on. Um, and, and whether it was a, a good fit for me, I, I just thought, oh, I'm on this finance path. And I guess success means continuing to make a certain amount of money or more money and continuing to move up uh, the corporate ladder without ever asking, is this really what I want to do? Yeah, that's powerful. Like we just kind of get in that like almost catatonic state and we just keep <laughs> moving each day through the motions without really stopping to to figure out does this make me happy <laughs> is this the right you know place for me to be and that could go so many different ways is this the right relationship is this the right place for me to live you could go on and on and on but but that's such a good point we just kind of go through the motions totally yeah i mean it's you know that's what the movies that's what tv shows are telling you in terms of trying to what 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 kind of job you you're supposed to have you might be getting messages from your parents on you know um, what type of jobs uh, might deem you as quote unquote successful the old be a doctor or a lawyer <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> but I don't want to be either of those <laughs> yeah yeah I don't I, I'm not doing Houser what am I supposed to do with that yeah, I, I actually started in college. Um, I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And the second class I had to take was a kinesiology class. And they got to the part where I had to start dissecting things. And I was like, wait a minute, what does this have to do with me being a sports broadcaster? I, I can't do this. There's no way doctor would have ever been in my future. <laughs> me too. Me too. I, I don't like the dissecting exercise either. <laughs> well, I have to ask you, uh, friend to friend, entrepreneur to entrepreneur, you launched your book in the middle of this global pandemic. Tell me a little bit, like, how did this change your launch or how did this change your message or uh, how, just how has this time impacted you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think from an actual book launch, it, it's it's definitely very different than uh, what I imagine in my head when I when I started this process, you know, you imagine that once you're finally done with the book and it hits the streets, you know, you you run out of place, you you have all your friends, family, and everyone that's helped you along the way, um, and you and you toast to the to the book and and just have fun. Um, my reality was was quite different. I um, 
I, I think the they were they were thinking about putting travel bans in and out of New York, Connecticut, um, and, and that area. And I live in New York City, so um, I, I think uh, they, in the days leading up to the book launch, my wife and I were frantically packing all the paper supplies that we had. And uh, eventually, my mother-in-law came up to pick us up and drove us back down to Northern Virginia, and we had a car full of all the toilet paper, paper towels, uh, and cat food that we could, that we could, uh, stuff in there. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of general marketing or, or messages, yeah, it's definitely been, uh, an interesting time. I, th- I think it was kind of anticlimactic just because I had other things on my mind in sure, terms yes. of like setting up the infrastructure in Northern Virginia, but like certainly, you know, a message that you say, oh yeah, just go to, uh, you know, get my book. Uh, it's sold anywhere. Bookstores are, uh, it's sold in any bookstore. It's like, well, you can't really go to bookstores right now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can go online and, um, I, I think Amazon at the time too was, was, um, deprioritizing non-essential items. Um, and so that was a time around the launch, I think, where you could add the book in, um, and Amazon was like, well, you'll get it at the end of the month. <laughs> right. Exactly. You're like, wait a minute, Amazon, that's not our deal. Totally, our deal totally. is that we order something and we get it in two days. So what is going on? Yeah. I'm like, this isn't prime now. This is like prime. What the heck, what the heck is that? <laughs> We're all demanding our prime refunds now. Like, come on. But yeah, I mean, I think I think it's such a great message to share. And I I wanted to to obviously bring it up because I think a lot of people during this time are either had something they were going to launch. Maybe it's as big of a book or maybe it's a small workshop or it could be a regular brick and mortar business. And just the, the fear and not knowing, should I launch? Should I not launch? How are things going to change? You know, obviously we're going to be this way for a little while. So I think it's always important to to share stories and and to maybe have a little laugh about it. That you know, <laughs> this is this is the world we're in right now. Totally, and I and I think that uh, you know whether to launch you know book launch if it if it doesn't go well during a pandemic is probably um, the least worry of of anyone. I, I think you know we know a lot of people that have been impacted. You know whether they know people that have COVID nineteen, um, or they had a wedding planned uh, around this time that they had to cancel, or you know they're 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 pregnant and they're delivering a baby, and there's just you know all the anxiety around um, that. So I think it's this this has definitely impacted a lot of parts of uh, people's lives. Yeah, and I want to dive into some of the things in the book. I think that. This notion, you talk about side hustles in the book, and we we hear a lot about side hustles. And I think people now maybe who didn't have a side hustle are thinking about how do I get a side hustle? Is that still possi- possibility for me? Then walk me through a little bit of of like what we need to know about about side hustles and how we could make side hustles really work for us. Yeah, I think side hustles are are such a great um great way to to test drive or experiment with uh, a potential new path. And I I think I used to think that I had to do something drastic with my life, like quit my job, switch to a totally different industry or travel the world to to kind of change my life. And, you know, over the years, what I've realized is doing these small experiments or test drives through a side hustle kind of gives you data to be able to say, well, do I even really like real estate or or whatever field that you're getting into? And so, um, you know, I think I think the how to start out with the side hustle is kind of the same way that we started the conversation. I think it's it's knowing yourself, um, and knowing your interests and your skills, and then from there starting to look into areas um, that could potentially be of interest. Um, I think it's also important to know why you want to start a side hustle. You know, there's some people that want to do it because they want to make extra money, or maybe they want to test drive a a new career, or maybe um, their day job doesn't allow them to utilize certain skills and they want to be able to flex those somewhere else. So I think it's important to kind of get the why of why you want to have a side hustle. And then together with trying to map your interests and skills with what could be 
an interesting service or product that that you provide. And I think the third thing that's really important um, is just creating the time. Um, you know, I, I read a lot of blog blog posts where um, bloggers are like, oh, it's so easy to start a side hustle. And it's like, no, it's not. You, you know, all of our schedules are already packed. But I think being deliberate, you know, carving out um, a certain amount of hours, either in the, uh, the morning, after work or on the weekends and being uh, being consistent with that. Uh, can help you explore a lot of different areas. So how do you know, uh, this is probably a two-parter question, how do you know when that tipping point is, financially speaking, when your side hustle is, is starting to is starting to generate some revenue, some good revenue, enough so that you're thinking, okay, maybe I want to go for this full-time. And then on the reverse mm. of that, how do you know if Okay, this this side hustle is is not financially providing for me, or it's not something I'm enjoying. Like, how do you find those tipping points in there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of your first question, you know, once you've built up a side hustle, it's it's creating some revenue. Do you do you leave or not? I, I guess the the question is, do you really have to leave? Is 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 there a forcing function that is is pushing you? Th- to choose your day job or your side hustle. I talked to a number of different um, successful side hustlers that turned their um, side hustles into their main gig, but they cautioned against uh, you know, doing so uh, quickly. And, and one person actually said, I would keep both things going as, as long as possible. Um, and, and another person said that um, having two jobs actually made them do both better in a counterintuitive way. So um, I, I think having two forever may not be bad, um, but certainly if you're at a place where you're um, restricted on time uh, or, 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 or your side hustle starts to make significantly more, I, I think it is looking at, well, how much revenue are you, how much net revenue are you bringing in versus how much were you making in your day job or how much uh, you need to live on, um, and then what's kind of what's kind of the 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 bull case, the base case, and the bear bear case, or like what's the best case scenario, the base case scenario, and the worst case scenario in the next one, two, three years if you do take this full time. Um, and then the the last question I'd ask is, in that worst case scenario, could you handle that? Yeah, and I like that permission slip of why can't you have a job and a side hustle? Or why can't you have two side hustles? Whatever it may be, that permission slip that it doesn't have to be all one thing or all the other thing, I think is a really important message to share, as long as you can handle it, of course, like you just said. But I've never met anyone who was upset because they had more money. I don't know about you, but... (laughs) (laughs) Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. 
That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash ETM for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet, finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But... Then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. It's Tuesday, and we have an Ask Shauna from Michaela. And Michaela says, I just got started listening to your podcast a couple months ago, and I absolutely love it. I'm a graduate student. I'm about to graduate next May of 2021 and will be looking for a full-time job soon. My question is, what is your advice about negotiating salary and how to go about it? Also, what are your thoughts and advice about negotiating tuition reimbursement? Thank you for taking this time to read my question. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Well, Michaela, I'm so excited to have you as a listener. It means so much. I mean, you and everyone else listening are the reason that this podcast keeps going. So I so appreciate you tuning in and asking a great question. I was excited to hear, I think, that you're graduating next year, not this year. I really feel for anyone that is graduating either undergrad or graduate degree this year. I don't know what the job market is going to look like. And I know that it's scary for so many of you. But before I get to answer your question, I just wanted to reemphasize, I guess, that if you are graduating during this time, this is your time to build up your network. This is your time to pull out skills that you didn't know you have, to reimagine them, to think about, is there any way you could do something digitally? Is there any way you could earn money in maybe a roundabout way from what you thought your career was going to be? Now, of course, there are still companies hiring. Uh, People are still getting jobs. People are still earning a lot of money. But if you're in that sticky situation where you're unable to find a job, really dig into what your skills are. Dig into your network and don't be afraid to reach out to people because this is the time to do that. So Michaela, back to your question. I have had a few previous podcast episodes around salary negotiation. So be sure to go back in the catalog and check those out. I had at least one or two last year and a couple the year before. So um, there's some really good gems in there. Obviously, this question would probably take a whole episode to answer. So I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty But I will tell you that two of my very, very favorite resources are two people that I adore who have actually been guests on this show, Kelly Hoey, who is author of Build Your Dream Network, and Jacqueline Twilley, who is president of Zero Gap. Jacqueline herself has helped so many listeners of this podcast negotiate for a higher salary. 
and I cannot rave about her enough. So definitely be sure to check those resources both out. So yes, you should and can absolutely negotiate. And there are a couple of things that I would really suggest doing. Number one is research your potential position and then the average salary in your area given your skill set. If you go to Glassdoor, there are a lot of other sites where you can find a high and low range for salary, given that position, given where you live, given skill set, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives you a good idea for the range. And then depending on what the company is offering you, you can kind of feel out whether you're on the low side of that range or maybe you're on your own high side of that range. But I always suggest that you negotiate for a salary in that range, but at least I would say about 20, 25%, 30% maybe even higher than you would expect because the rules of negotiation are really like you think if you're going to buy a car, right? The the price says one thing, you're trying to get the price lower. The dealership is trying to keep the higher price, but there's always wiggle room in there, which is why, A, you should always negotiate when you go to buy a car. I don't care what that price says on the car, <laughs> but that's a, that's a side note. So when you are being offered a job and you're being offered a salary, obviously the company wants to get you in the door at the lowest possible salary. It's due their benefit. While you're on the other side saying, hey, but I am worth X amount of dollars. So I say the first rule of negotiation is really valuing yourself and knowing like, okay, if I go in with this higher number, I may not get it, but what if I did? Wouldn't that be freaking awesome? So let's just do an example. Let's say if my range was 50000 to 80000 based on my skills, but I know that I'm aiming for like 60000 That would make me really happy. I might actually go in asking for 75000 hoping that in the negotiation I land somewhere around... 60,000. So this is just, this is not a guideline. This is really situation specific, but I'm just trying to give you a little bit of uh, an idea how this might work. You have to know your skills, but you have to know what you're going to bring to the job and always relate your skills to how you're going to help the company. So for instance, let's say you're great with social media. So your killer social media skills are going to help the company reach more potential clients. So don't just stop with my skill is X. Continue on that that thread of how then that skill is going to help the company. Now you don't have to know exactly, but give them, paint the picture, right? Tell the story around you as to why they should hire you. So also, yes, negotiate for tuition reimbursement. Some companies actually have a set limit for how much they can offer and others are more flexible. Again, a company's not necessarily just going to throw these things out at you. You have to come in with your, I call it like your ABC negotiation list. So obviously A is that salary you want, but if they're not willing to get exactly where you want, maybe you have a B and a C list. Maybe there are a few other things other than salary that you can negotiate for, but those things are worth a value to you, right? So do your research, do your homework, but know your skills. Spend some time, just write down every crazy skill that you know you have and think about then how in that job title you would be able to help that company grow, uh, better customer service, reach more clients, I, whatever that happens to be, right? Right. So always relate those things back. So that is such a great question, Michaela. Thank you so much for asking it. Again, go back and check a few of the past episodes where we really spend 20, 30 minutes diving into this topic. And hey, listen, if you haven't asked Sean a question, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Head on over to the link in the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com right on the homepage. You can fill in a form to ask me a question. And you can feel free to put anonymous in. I don't have to say your name. But if you've got a question, raise your hand because I definitely want to try and get that answered. I've never heard anyone say like, oh, darn, I have too much money now. What am I going to do? <laughs> totally. And I, and I think going back to your point of why do you have to choose? I, I feel like that's one of the myths that um, we're taught of, you know, everyone 
has this one calling. You, you know, there's going to be the one, and one day you're going to find it after all of this research that you do. Uh, and I think that that sets an unreasonable expectation um, for whatever job that you have. And I think my message is you don't have to choose. And you could, um, you know, you can have multiple different things that are um, contributing to your professional satisfaction. I like that. I like that. And you you talked about miss. Um, I, I want to dive in a little bit to investing. I know it's kind of a hot topic right now. A lot <laughs> of people, a lot of different opinions. Uh, I know you talk about it in your book, but uh, right now, if if we've not started investing, should we be investing or how do we figure out what in the world to do with this time? So we're not we're not freaked out by the market going up, the market going down, backwards, forwards, all over the place. Like, do you have any sort of uh, guidance or wise words for us of, of how we should be thinking about investing? Totally. And I, again, I, it's I sound like a broken record sometimes, but I, I think it all goes back to um, you, your goals, and, and what you want. Because I think um, what you're investing for and the timetable for that will influence what you should be investing in. Um, and it, it is so easy to get distracted by these daily market movements uh, or what other people are trying to achieve when you don't really know uh, what you want. And over the last several months, people have, um, I think a good example is people have asked me, you know, should I buy a home now? Uh, you know, interest rates are at all time lows. Property values seem to be going down. It seems like a great time. And, and I always respond and I say, I have no idea. What do you want to buy a home? What other financial goals do you want um, to achieve? And how does buying a home fit into uh, your financial plan, but also your rich life? Uh, and so I think getting really clear on, on those goals, what kind of life that you want to live is kind of a first step. Um, and then I'd say for, for any goals that you want to achieve, uh, in five years or less, I usually uh, recommend keep, keeping that money in uh, cash, high yield savings account. Um, I get a pu- I get some pushback on that sometimes because people oh, say, so "Well, I. you know, I could be making so much more money in the market." And I say, "Okay, I'll add a, a, another variable to it. If your if your timeline is set, I want to buy a home in five years. Then I think you should keep the money in cash." Um, but if it's flexible uh, and, you you know, in five years, you for some reason don't have the down payment because the market went down and you'll say, yeah, that's OK, then maybe you could put some money um, into the market. I think there's also the um, the idea of, you know, what is your financial situation right now in terms of cash flow? If you're certainly in a situation where you're, you're just trying to make ends meet. Um, just, just focus on that. Don't feel bad about, um, not putting money into the market right now. But, you know, if you're in, um, another situation where you still have your job, you're still making good money, uh, and your know, retirement is 20, 30, 40 years away. Um, I'd say continue to stick with the planning and putting money into the market. Yeah, I think that's really good advice and and sort of feeling your way through the noise and figuring out what are those goals for your life and what's the time frame of that is really important. And you talked about this idea of a living a rich life. What are some of the other components, maybe some things we hadn't talked about that that go into living a rich kind of life? I think it's different for I think it's different for each person. And I think your rich life is probably different um, based on what phase uh, of life that you're in. Certainly the the life that I'm living now or the life that I wanted to live now um, might be different than when I was in my 20s. Um, I I read this somewhere once where I I think they said being rich is, you know, being able to... um, you know, take a longer lunch break or being able to wake up later or being able to, you know, kind of delay the timing of things like deciding what you do, when you do it, uh, who you do it with. Um, and so for me, I define uh, a rich life for me is um, certainly being 
financially stable and sound, being able to achieve all of my goals. Um, but then outside of all those concrete goals, just having the flexibility options, um, options to, um, you know, buy a bigger apartment if I wanted to, options to take a break from work uh, if, if, if I want to, um, what have you. So that, that flexibility to me um, is my rich life. And I feel like we have some time on our hands right now for we don't know how long, but we're all we're all working from home. Is there an exercise or some questions or, or something that someone can do if they've never been through this process of really thinking about like what is their version of a rich life? Are, are there any questions that you can kind of give us as like guiding questions for things either for us to write down or just to think about how we would really define this in our own life and then how we then attach what we're doing with our money to that to that vision? Totally. Yeah. So on the book website, workyourmoneybook.com, there's a worksheets tab, and then I have um, uh, career-related worksheets and then money-related worksheets. And this is freely available to anybody, whether they buy the book or not. So if, if uh, listeners click on the work-related worksheets, one of the tabs uh, is an exercise on how to map out your ideal weekday uh, and weekend day. And I think that's, that's one of the exercises that um, you could do to start thinking about, well, what does that look like? You know, what, what do I like to do? And I think there's some other exercises in there um, specifically on jobs. And I, I kind of map it around value, you know, is am I getting value? Am I adding value? Does this, does this job align with my values? So starting to ask those questions uh, and then thinking about, well, how does that, what financial goals fit into helping me um work in the job that I want and live the life that I want. And, you know, after doing that exercise, you might think, well, yeah, no, I, I want to be location independent or I want to be able to travel around. Um, and so buying a home might not fit after all and that you can throw that financial goal by the wayside and focus on um, other meaningful goals for yourself. That's great because it brings so much clarity, I think, because it is so easy to get caught up in, well, I'm, I, I guess I'm just, I'm supposed to buy a house. Like that's the progression of whatever society has told me what I'm supposed to do with my money. And now I'm supposed to do X with my money. But I think it's important to take that step back and think about, well, but is that actually really right for you? And really, you're the only one that can answer that question. If you if you hire a financial planner or whatever that may be, I mean, that person can't. That person can look at your at your math and the numbers and figure out if it's possible and what you need to do to save. But they can't answer that core question of is that the right thing for you? Totally. And I I want to talk a little bit too about. I'm sure that we have some people listening that. Maybe they've lost their jobs. Um, maybe they are running a small business or they're entrepreneur, and the the cash flow is is dried up. And of course, there's a lot of anxiety around things right now. But I want to give some proactive tips. What are some ways that people can uh, either cut expenses, cut their spending right now? What are maybe some proactive things they could do with their money uh, that might help them during this time, particularly if they're in one of those situations where they either lost their job or their small business is a little bit struggling? Yeah, totally. I think um, just reviewing your living expenses over the past year or the past couple months and, and getting a sense of what you spend your money on. I, I do this exercise with a lot of clients and I think how much they think they spend versus how much they really spend uh, is, is a totally different, uh, it's, it's usually in a totally different ballpark. Yes. It's amazing <laughs> that, that, that human mind of ours that convinces ourselves of, but, but we think we're only spending X amount on, let's say, eating out. And really, the number is quite different. Yeah. <laughs> and we're all guilty of it. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. And so I, I think just doing that uh, initial exercise is really helpful of where is my money going now? And then I think once you have that tabulation of listing expenses, you can start to figure out what you may be able to cut out. And I think 
Uh, the good thing is about sheltering in place and social distancing is you might have naturally cut out uh, a lot of expenses already. You're not going to the movies. You're probably not going out to eat or traveling. So right there, or getting a haircut, by the way, yes. I, gave my, I, I unsuccessfully gave myself a, a haircut the other day and, and now <laughs> I have a, a bowl cut. Nice. Nice. Um, so you're, you're, you're probably not spending on that, but then I, I think there's, there's small, medium and large things that you might be able to cut out. Small stuff is stuff that's relatively painless. Like, um, you know, if you're incurring ATM fees or foreign transaction fees or late payment fees, there's easy fixes to either changing to a, a different bank or credit card to be able to decrease that, changing to, um, auto pay to get rid of late payment fees. Um, on the medium impact side, I'd say, you know, reviewing subscriptions. Are you still using all the subscri subscriptions that you have? Do you have uh, subscriptions that overlap each other? I've seen clients that had uh, Google Drive and, and Dropbox. Um, I think consolidating, oftentimes you have people in a family that have uh, individual subscriptions of a certain service, call it Spotify. And if they consolidate it into a family subscription, they could save uh, on that as well. And then I think that, you know, since no one's really going to work right now, uh, if you are funding a monthly Metro Pass or Subway Pass, uh, just to, to just remember to uh, turn that off for now. Um, and then on the large side, you know, if you if you are in credit card debt, I would I would uh, reach out to your uh, lender uh, to see if they're willing to, to lower your interest rate or potentially look into uh, refinancing that debt into a, a new credit card or a personal loan. Um, I think it could also be a good time to um, look into whether it makes sense to refinance your mortgage as well um, if you own your home. And then if you rent, um, now may be a good time to negotiate your rent, uh, especially if you've been a great tenant, always paid on time. And so I think those are some of the some of the ways. And I, I of course, potentially refinancing uh, student loans as well. Yeah, it's such great advice. I mean, there's so many things. I, I've been talking lately about what we can control and what we can't control. Obviously, there are a lot of things we can't control. But with our money, what we can control is being in our numbers, looking at where our expenses are going and almost being a detective and saying, do I need this expense? Do I not need this expense? In a way that maybe we haven't either had time for or really been motivated to do before. So using this time to to do that exercise with uh, of course, without being scared or fearful, it, it's, it can be really empowering, especially when you find some money and you're like, wow, I just found an extra hundred bucks or 200 bucks or whatever it may be. I mean, that's that's like an amazing thing. That money was just sitting there waiting for you to find it. So I love that you shared that. Uh, I wanted to just end with, you've given us like, so many great action steps, but I really want people to feel empowered, inspired, whatever that word is for the rest of the year, that that they can take action with their money and that um, they can still make progress with their goals. So do you have maybe like a couple action steps, a couple takeaways from your book, Work My Money, Not My Life, um, <clears throat> that you can that you can share with us today that we can we can walk away with? Yeah, I think it's I think it's uh, figure out where you are financially uh, and professionally. And if that's where you want to be, uh, financially, that's, uh, making sure you're, if you're not already tracking, tracking your net worth on a monthly, uh, or quarterly basis, um, figuring out your living expenses, uh, and then checking, monitoring your credit score. Um, and then on a career side, really putting your, your current career to the test and, and seeing, uh, does this really align with my interests and skills and, and wh what I want to be doing? or what I want to be spending my time. Um, and then really thinking about, well, where do I want to go? What does what my ideal life look like? And going through that ideal day exercise and then starting to map in, well, what type of careers could allow me to live that life? Um, and that's going to take some online research, but then also reaching out to people in your network on uh, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, or whatever the, the hot uh, social media thing is right now uh, to get the inside scoop from them on, um, you know, what is this job like? Um, and then from there, uh, you know, I think once you know the kind of career that you, you, you want to do, 
um, starting to map up the rest of your financial goals from there. All right, action plan. Step one, create the vision you want for your life. Dream it up, map it out, and then step two, take action to get your money to work for you to bring that vision to life. Do yourself a favor and head on over to workyourmoneybook.com to grab some really awesome career and money worksheets that Roger mentioned in this interview. You can also pick up a copy of his book anywhere books are sold. Again, the name of the book is Work Your Money, Not Your Life. You know the drill. On this podcast, we are changing our language around money to help everyone unlock the lives they want to live. Now that you're part of this movement, it's up to everyone to invite others in. So share this episode with someone that you know needs to hear this message. Invite them in so we can all talk about money in a new, fun, and hopefully fresh way. Thanks for checking out this episode of Millennial Money. For all the BTS on today's episode, check out the show notes. Oh, and while you're at it, share this episode with a friend, share it with your coworkers, even share it with that cute barista who gets your name correct every time. Money mindfulness is something we could all use a little help with. So why keep all this knowledge to yourself? Remember, sharing is caring. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future too, and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance, so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value.